Good afternoon, and welcome to the webinar uh, titled, What Trauma-Informed Care Really Means, or How to Make Your Agency a Truly Trauma-Informed Care Agency. My name is Ned Lochran. I'm the Executive Director of the Council of Juvenile Correctional Administrators, better known as CJCA. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by the CJCA Mental Health Work Group, which is made up of the mental health or clinical directors of the state youth correction systems, including 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and some large county jurisdictions. The Mental Health Work Group meets monthly by phone under the leadership of Jennifer Jaworski, the Director of Mental Health Services for the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice. And before I introduce Jennifer, who will tell you a little bit about the work group and uh, the, this four-part webinar series, and then introduce our presenters, I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping rules. One, if you're calling in by phone, use the telephone option on your screen. That's very important so we don't get unwanted feedback. Uh, type in your questions at any point during the webinar presentation on the control panel on the right side of your screen where the green telephone is located as well. And by the way, we're going to dedicate at least 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for uh, our presenters to answer your questions. Uh, I'll read them and, uh, the, uh, present and direct them to one or both of the presenters. Um, so in, the earlier you type in the question, the better chance you have of getting the question answered because we get a slew of them at the end, not too many of them at the beginning. Uh, we'll send you a copy of today's PowerPoint uh, and a copy of the video recording. And then finally, if you missed any of the previous webinars on trauma-informed care, you can view them on the CJCA uh, YouTube uh, site. So with that, I'm uh, very pleased uh, and thankful to Jennifer Jaworski, who has a very busy daytime job, but she has taken the time to put this committee together. They've been meeting for about two years now. They meet monthly, and uh, they are the ones who have produced uh, these four webinars on trauma-informed care. Jennifer? Thank you, Ned. I appreciate that. Um, as Ned said, we have, this committee has spent uh, past two years learning about the services each state provides in its facilities. We have come to realize not only our differences, but how much we share. Gaining knowledge of each other's state juvenile justice operations has created a bond that allows many jurisdiction-to-jurisdiction -jurisdiction conversations to occur. Members of our group support each other, and a wealth of information has been made available. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of our work group is a number of sidebars where we call, e we email each other and um, ask for information, and um, it's, it's been very productive. Um, today is the last in our series of four webinars on trauma-informed care, and um, our presenter today, two, we have two people presenting today, Christopher Branson, who is a PhD in clinical psychologist and assistant professor at NYU School of Medicine, whose work focuses on improving access to effective social services for youth and families involved in the juvenile justice system. Dr. Branson has provided training and consultation on the implementation of trauma-informed practices to juvenile justice agencies in seven states. He is a principal investigator for the NIMH-funded study that evaluates the process and impacts of implementing trauma-informed practice and organizational change in five New York City agencies, probation, detention, diversion, and drug court. Right. Dr. Branson's work is informed by his experience as a former juvenile, uh, former juvenile offender. It was interesting how um, Christopher and I met. I was at an ISTSS conference in Miami, and he was presenting. I was impressed with his uh, presentation, and we started talking, and he actually was able was very instrumental in securing some of our wonderful presenters for this series. So thank you, Christopher, for that. Um, Christopher is also going to be presenting with Carly Bates today. She is a PhD psychologist and postdoctoral fellow at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Dr. Bates has more than five years of experience providing mental health services to children, adolescents, and young adults involved in the juvenile justice and child welfare system and has been trained in several evidence-based trauma treatments. In her current role, Dr. Bates is assisting with consultation, staff training, organizational self-assessment, and 
overall implement, implementation of trauma-informed care in New York City's juvenile justice agencies. She previously, previously presented youth, represented youth in child protective and juvenile delinquency cases as a staff attorney for the Legal Aid Society. I forgot to mention she also has a Juris Doctorate. So with that, I'm going to turn this presentation over to Christopher Branson and Carly Bates, and um, thank you again. All right. Well, thank you, Ned and Jennifer, for the uh, the introduction. And hi, all. Good afternoon. This is uh, Christopher Branson. Hi, everyone. This is Carly Bates. And uh, you know, we we're excited uh, for today's webinar, and appreciate that so many of you have joined us. Um, so, you know, today's webinar is going to be about you know we're going to really dive into what trauma informed care means. You know, this is a a term that gets uh, thrown around a lot in the juvenile justice field. It's a really hot topic. But we find there's still a lot of confusion around what exactly this means and how do you start to become a trauma-informed agency or system. So we're, you know, this is not going to be a Trauma 101 talk. We're going to get really detailed, um, you know, talk about the core elements of a trauma-informed agency, uh, identify some specific resources. We're going to talk about, you know, the challenges of trying to put this stuff into place. And we're going to illustrate it all using uh, some real-world case examples from uh, projects that we've worked on. And then again, uh, time is given for Q&A. All right. Oops. So that's the overview of what we'll uh, be covering today. And if you've, uh, for those of you in the audience, uh, if you've called in, if you can make sure to put your phone on mute because we're getting some uh, feedback right now. All right. So. We're going to keep the introductory trauma stuff really brief, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so what you see here is the DSM-5 definition of a traumatic event. So DSM-5 is a book that all mental health people use to diagnose mental health conditions. And so, uh, you know, I'm not going to read it for you, but trauma can be something you directly experience, like abuse or sexual assault. It can be something you witness. But the one I really want to highlight is the third one, uh, repeated or extreme exposure to details of traumatic events, because this is relevant to the frontline staff, um, you know, who, you know, who, you know, if you work with traumatized offenders, you hear their traumatic experiences, the stories they've been through, that can be traumatizing in and of itself. All right, see if I can get this slide to advance. All right. So, the other piece of Trauma 101 I want to go over that relates to everything else we'll talk about is the body's alarm system. Um, so the body, every single person uh, on this planet has something in their brain uh, that I'm going to refer to as the alarm system. And basically its only job is to look for possible danger and then help you stay alive in those situations. And so you may, you may have heard of the phrase like fight, fight or flight, which is what we're talking about here. And again, real quick, if you're on, uh, if you're on the phone, if you could, uh, you know, mute your phone or turn off your speakers because I'm getting some feedback. All right. So, so let me illustrate how the body's alarm system works. So let's imagine, you know, for those of you living in cities that uh, you're walking across the street, not paying attention, maybe texting, you almost get hit by a car. If you don't live in a city, maybe you know you're in rush hour. Suddenly someone swerves in front of you or slams on their brakes and you have to make a split second decision. Or if you live in a real rural area, maybe you're walking, you know, and you come across a snake that looks poisonous. So in any of those situations, think about what you did. Did you sit there and carefully consider your options? Think about, you know, what's the best way to not get hit by this car? No. If you did that, you wouldn't be here. What happened is you reacted instantly, I'm guessing. You know, maybe you, if that car was coming, you ran out of the way. You know, some of you might have gotten scared and froze. You know, uh, some of you might have, you know, gone into fight mode and started, you know, cursing at the person who almost hit you. All of that is your alarm kicking into gear to keep you alive. So let me quickly break down how the alarm works. So when, you, when, you, uh, when your alarm senses some kind of danger, all these changes happen instantaneously in your body to prepare you to react. So one of the first things is your body releases all this adrenaline. So that gives you the energy if you need to run away from a threat or you need to fight to defend yourself. Um, 
your heart starts pounding because it's pumping the blood to your major muscle groups. Uh, so again, you can run or defend yourself. Your blood actually, uh, your blood vessels constrict, your blood flows away from the surface of your skin. So if you get cut, you don't get injured, you don't lose so much blood. Your hands and your feet sweat, you know, so that you can grip a weapon or, you know, before shoes, sweaty feet would help you grip the ground. And, you know, when you're in alarm mode, your body is only focused on safety. So anything else that's going on in your body, basically there's no time for that. So for example, if you're digesting food and suddenly your alarm goes off, your body may say, you know what, we, we can't waste energy digesting food. So we're going to have to let that go, which is why you sometimes hear people say they were scared shitless, excuse my language, or so scared they peed their pants. That's the alarm going into action. Now, one of the most important changes that happens in the body when the alarm goes off is in the brain. So if you think about the way the brain works, and I'm not going to get all complicated, but think about there's the parts of your brain where you have executive function. That's how you plan your day, you solve problems, things like that. You have the part of your brain where you have your memories, where you think about how you've handled similar situations in the past, and you have the alarm. So if the, if the alarm is going off, it basically takes over because there's no time to think about, you know, think through your options and all that. You need to just react. And so, you know, again, you're not thinking about uh, what's for dinner tonight or what I'm doing this week, and you're thinking, danger, what do I do to be safe? So the alarm is an amazing thing. It keeps us alive. But what happens once you go through a trauma, it's like your alarm says, man, I had one job to keep you safe and I failed. So from here on out, I'm, it's better safe than sorry. If I think there's the slightest chance you're in danger, I'm going off. If anything reminds me of that traumatic experience, I'm going off. And so what happens is people start to have what we call false alarms, meaning their body's alarm goes off as if they're in danger when they're really not, you know. So for a kid who, uh, you know, was verbally and physically abused by their parents, being yelled at by an adult might remind them of the yelling that occurred right before the abuse happened. And it may make their body and their alarm feel as if they're in imminent danger, even though they're not. And so the downsides of these false alarms is, you know, People who've been through trauma, they, they overreact. You know, in situations that aren't really dangerous, they have this really strong reaction that can be hard to understand. <clears throat> uh, it's also exhausting to be in alarm mode all the time. You know, that's only supposed to happen every now and then. But if you've been through a lot of trauma, you might be having false alarms several times a day. And so we have kids who smoke weed because that's the only way they know how to turn off their alarm or fight to get all that adrenaline out because they don't know what else to do. Um, but for me, the worst part of false alarms is it causes people to act in a way that contradicts their values and their goals. You know, so you may have a kid who really wants to graduate high school. They're determined, but something about school triggers them. It's the criticism from teachers, the bullying at schools, feeling hopeless, and so they stop going. Even though they desperately want to graduate, it feels so unsafe that they can't. So. You know, the issue of false alarms is going to come up a lot uh, through the remainder of this talk. So real quick stats uh, on why we need to talk about trauma in the juvenile justice system. So kids in juvenile justice, but particularly kids in juvenile correctional settings, have really high rates of trauma exposure, so 90% or more. And we're not talking about one trauma. On average, we're talking multiple traumas. You know, so uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, domestic violence, being physically assaulted, shot, stabbed, losing loved ones uh, to violence. So, you know, you can assume that the majority of kids walking into your facilities have experienced trauma and probably more than one. But why does trauma matter? The kids you see have a lot of issues. Why focus on trauma? Well, because the kids who have multiple traumas or have post-traumatic stress symptoms, they're much worse off than other kids in the system. They have, you know, higher rates of substance use, higher rates of depression. Uh, they're more likely to try to commit suicide, more likely to drop out of school, more likely to join a gang. And they also have worse legal outcomes. 
They're more likely to continue uh, to offend into adulthood. They're more likely to be incarcerated. They're more likely to commit violent and sexual offenses. And if you think you know, want to take it really practical to how this affects your facilities, they're more likely to act up in a juvenile correctional setting. Um, and then the last piece is, you know, these kids come to the system with lots of trauma, but then things we do in the system can add new trauma, uh, you know, or exacerbate their distress. So there's some research showing that kids who are exposed to violence in correctional settings or harsh punishments like punitive isolation or physical restraint, those kids are more likely to recidivate once they're released. And it increases their PTSD symptoms, which in and of itself is a risk factor for legal problems. So real quickly, I want to talk about, you know, uh, things that we do in the juvenile justice system that could either add new trauma to a kid or set off their false alarm. Uh, so one is just being placed in a correctional facility. You know, so if you're someone who's been abandoned by your family, you've been removed from your home and placed in foster care, just being taken away from your family can be a huge uh, trigger. And when I say trigger, I mean something that sets off a false alarm. Uh, like we said, uh, use of seclusion, being physically restrained, um, strip searches, being patted down, particularly for folks who've had sexual abuse. The same is true for urine toxicology screens. Obviously, violence uh, in correctional facilities can add new trauma. Now, this one may not be obvious, but a lack of choice in service planning. Because when you're being traumatized, you have no control. Something's happening to you. And so when kids who've been through trauma feel like they don't have control over a situation, that can really trigger them. And so that's something we're going to come back to, is giving kids a voice in the services that they receive. But the impact of trauma isn't just limited to the kids. It really affects staff. And this is something I'm going to emphasize, because too many talks on trauma-informed care just ignore this. And this is particularly relevant uh, in correctional settings. So. Correctional officers experience more workplace violence than any profession in this country except for police officers. Also, we know the majority of juvenile justice professionals experience secondary trauma exposure, which means hearing the details of traumas experienced by kids or seeing how it plays out in their lives. Uh, and we actually, Carly and I, are finishing up a review paper. We looked at all the research out there on uh, PTSD, secondary trauma among juvenile and criminal justice staff. And if you look at studies of correctional staff, 25 to 60 percent have significant PTSD symptoms. To put that into perspective, the general population, about 7 percent. Soldiers returning from Iraq and Afghanistan, about 20 to 30 percent. So your staff is likely more traumatized than military veterans, just to put that into perspective. So we will come back to that. So what exactly is trauma-informed care? Well, you know, it goes beyond just trying to, you know, screen kids for trauma and providing treatment for trauma. It's really taking a look at, it's an organization or system-wide approach. It's not just something the mental health staff do. It's something everyone has to be a part of. Now, as you'll, we'll discuss in a minute, you know, the field is still coming to a precise definition of what trauma-informed care means. Uh, but SAMHSA, which is part of the government, they have this uh, something they call the four R's of trauma-informed care, which I think is a really helpful, easy way of thinking about it. So if you're a trauma-informed agency, you realize that trauma is widespread among your kids and your staff. You're able to recognize the signs that your kids or your staff are having reactions to trauma. You're, you have skills or procedures for responding to it. And like I was just talking about, you try to avoid doing things that may re-traumatize kids or staff. So for a lot of juvenile correctional facilities, this represents a major shift. Um, and it's no small undertaking. You can't do one day trauma training and now you're trauma informed. It's really a process. And so for the remainder of the talk, we're going to focus on what that process looks like. All right. So, uh, so as I mentioned, there's not yet, you know, 
a consensus-based or widely accepted definition of exact, what exactly trauma-informed care means for juvenile justice. Um, Carly and I actually just finished another journal paper. We looked at all the published definitions of trauma-informed care. And so the things we're presenting today represent the areas where there seems to be the most consensus. Um, so I'm not going to dive into them now. These are what we're going to dive into in a minute, but I just wanted to lay them out there so you can see where we're going. Okay, uh, so now let's, before we jump into the specifics, I want to talk about some of the barriers, uh, you know, to putting trauma-informed care into place, because you have to think about these things from the very beginning, you know, from starting to plan the initiative, thinking about who's going to be involved in that conversation, you know, how you're going to go about it. Um, so there are, you know, we sort of broke this up into staff barriers and then some more agency-level barriers. So. You know, when working with staff, um, you know, getting that buy-in from staff and really um, helping them to understand what trauma-informed care is and, you know, finding out what they know about trauma-informed care can really help. For a lot of staff, you know, this is a really new concept. You know, some staff in corrections may have more social work-minded, you know, perspectives and some, uh, you know, have more corrections mindsets. Um, so burnout, we're going to talk a little bit more um, later about secondary trauma and, and traumatic stress for staff, but this can really impair job performance for staff members, and so that can be a significant barrier when you're, you know, trying to implement trauma-informed care. And then staff turnover. So, you know, going in, we're, we're working with some agencies right now where we've trained, you know, a lot of the staff members, and then those staff members leave. Um, and so that can, that can present a, you know, a significant challenge when you're trying to implement trauma-informed care and make it sustainable um, for the long term for that agency. And then also just sort of the commitment um, to trauma-informed care and really implementing it in the agency, you know, commitment by the leadership, whether they're really committed to implementing those principles, those practices, and seeing that carried out over the long term. Yeah, yeah and the thing I'll add about that, because, uh, you know, in some agencies, we get the sense that leaders almost want to check trauma-informed care off their list. But this is not going to be some one one day task that you then complete, you know. So again, as we're going to illustrate, it really is an ongoing process, um, and leadership needs to be clear about that and understand what that in, entails. Right. So you know, other barriers, sort of more on the agency level. So having a culture within the organization where there's already you know a lack of communication and mistrust between the staff and the leadership, um, or between different disciplines. So maybe mental health staff and correction staff. Um, can present a challenge and also of course lack of resources you know a lot of um, what we're going to be talking about doesn't necessarily take a lot of money but other things do um, and certainly corrections agencies you know have limited time um, and limited money uh, so that can be really difficult and one of the issues we run into uh, in one of the prisons we're working in is you know be, even being able to schedule staff training because somebody has to cover the units still run the prison you know, and so that either requires, you know, arranging coverage or trying to get people to come in on the day off, which then it becomes a union issue and there's overtime. And so that in and of itself is a real significant challenge uh, in a facility like many of you work in. And I think, you know, related to that, sort of the planning for the process, I think as Chris mentioned earlier, it's a process. It takes time. And for a lot of agency leaders, to their credit, they want this implemented and they want it implemented yesterday, um, which is great, uh, but it does take a lot of time. So, so sometimes there can be, you know, um, un unrealistic expectations on the part of the agency that, you know, as consultants and trainers, it's not possible to meet those demands. Um, and we really want to do it right. Um, and then, you know, another challenge on an agency level is sort of this um, lack of ongoing supervision and consultation on, you know, implementing these new practices. These are new practices for a lot of the staff members, and it, it you know, it requires, um, you know, consultation and working with case examples and ongoing examples, and often that's not in place already. Yeah, and so we'll, we'll uh, flesh out that last point a little bit more uh, when we talk about staff training. All right. So, you know, Carly mentioned that staff attitudes can be a barrier, uh, you know, to implementing trauma-informed care. Um, and so, you know, we put up some of the common concerns that we've heard from the various agencies that we work with. Uh, you know, so number one is the flavor of the month. You know, 
juvenile justice systems always have new initiatives. There's always new priority areas for reform. You know, and staff tell us there's often multiple things going on at once, and they have no idea what the priority is. You know, and often these, you know, projects are put into place without great planning or enough resources, and they fail. And that's kind of what staff expects with this. Just another flavor of the month. It's going to flame out pretty quickly. Uh, another one <clears throat> is that it's uh, it's soft on crime, or in the words of one correctional officer, it's hugs for thugs. Um, the idea that oh, because these poor kids have been traumatized, that means we let them do whatever they want. You know, we don't punish them, and it's going to put everyone in danger. And that's not the case. You know, and so we'll talk in a little bit about you know how you sell it to staff. Um, you know, and so along with that, if you you know they think they're not going to be able to punish kids you know, uh, can't hold them accountable, so that's going to put everyone in danger. Another really common concern is we're trying to turn correctional officers into therapists, which we absolutely are not. Uh, and again, we'll talk about that a little more in the staff training section. This last one I think is really important, you know, because if your trauma-informed care is a massive change from the way most correctional facilities are doing things. So a lot of staff take that as a criticism of, you know, you're saying we're not doing things right. We're not treating kids the right way. You know, that basically we need to start over from scratch. Um, and so with that, you know, one thing I'll say is, look, we, we don't want to get rid of anything that works. We just want to have more tools, uh, you know, and, and put additional things into place. But if you have something that works, we don't want to take that away. So, you know, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, addressing these concerns, one of the most important things you can do is think about how you're going to sell this project to staff up front. Because it doesn't matter if the leader is invested, if the rest of the staff haven't bought in, they're the ones who are actually going to carry it out. So you have to have them on board. You don't have to have everyone, and you're never going to have everyone, especially at first. Some people it's going to take a while to convince, but you have to make an effort. Um, and so Carly's going to lay out some of the, uh, the potential benefits that we've mentioned or that staff we've trained have, have told us are benefits. So, you know, going back to this idea that um, the trauma-informed care is letting kids get away with bad behavior, when really it's about teaching, you know, kids accountability, how to self-regulate, you know, and stay, and stay out of trouble in the future. Um, also, you know, improving staff's ability, so really making their jobs easier when they're interacting with youth. Um, gaining their trust, building rapport with them, and, you know, that makes the work a little bit easier. This work is really difficult, but it makes it a little bit easier and, you know, improves outcomes for both staff and youth. Um, you know, encouraging staff, you know, letting them know that trauma-informed care is really helping them determine when trauma may be, inter you know, interfering with youth functioning, contributing to their behavior, and then really empowering them with the tools to figure out how to help address um, how that trauma is impacting youth. And then for staff, you know, being able to improve their, their safety, both physical and psychological, which we'll talk about a little bit later, um, and really keeping them safe in, in their environment by empowering them with skills and tools for being able to, to know how to de-escalate um, a situation when a, you know, a youth is triggered or even when they're triggered or a coworker is triggered. Yeah, so, you know, my first piece of real practical advice is don't make the mistake. When you're introducing trauma-informed care, don't introduce it as this is a way to treat our kids better. You know, that's clearly an important piece of it. But emphasize the benefits for staff because working in corrections, as you all know, that's an extremely stressful job. And there's all kinds of research on all kinds of health problems, shorter life expectancy for correctional officers. And so you need to emphasize that this project is for them, too, because it really is. Because, and we'll come back to this, but if your staff are not well and not feeling safe, they cannot create a safe environment for your kids. And again, when people feel, trauma survivors feel unsafe, they have false alarms, which is at the root of a lot of the problems going on uh, in facilities. I guarantee it. All right. So uh, we're about to jump in to the, the different domains and get really specific. Um, and we're going to be weaving in examples uh, from some of our real world experience. So we just want to lay out really quickly, you know, so Jennifer mentioned uh, we have this 
our biggest project is here in New York City. Um, so we're working with five agencies. Uh, the one most relevant to y'all, we're at Rikers Island, um, the infamous prison, uh, and trying to make them trauma-informed. Uh, also providing consultation uh, for the Florida Department of Juvenile Justice on three of their juvenile correctional facilities, all maximum security. Uh, one was all girls and the other two all boys. Uh, also, a county in Virginia hired us to do an organizational assessment uh, of their whole justice system to see how trauma-informed they were and provide recommendations. And then there's also uh, three other states or counties where we provide training. Um, so we'll weave in examples from those projects. All right, so the first domain is staff knowledge and training. This is one of the most important pieces of any trauma-informed care initiative. Again, all of your staff need to have a shared understanding of trauma, how trauma affects kids' behavior, you know, how procedures in the justice system may trigger kids, set them off, but then also really understanding how trauma can affect staff. You know, we find that almost no staff, you know, of all the agencies we've worked with, almost no one has had a supervisor talk to them about secondary trauma, but as soon as we describe it, they know exactly what we mean. They're living it. Um, now, it is not enough for your staff to just understand trauma. They have to have specific skills for responding. And this is where a lot of training curriculums out there fall short. They give you all this trauma 101 knowledge, but then they don't tell you what to do in the heat of the moment. And that is what staff are desperate for. Okay, great. I understand trauma affects trust, all that. Great. But what do I do when a kid in front of me is blowing up? How do I de-escalate that without using force? You know, so, and we'll talk, we'll give you some examples of curriculums that do that and talk a little bit about the kinds of skills, but I cannot stress that enough. And you need to give this training to everyone uh, because anyone that interacts with the kids could potentially be a trigger for them or they could potentially be someone that helps that kid. And if everyone is on the same page, you know, then they're, con they're being consistent in how they're helping, you know, responding to kids' behavior and helping kids cope. So can't just be the mental health staff that have this knowledge and skills because they're the ones who actually interact with kids the least. The correctional staff, the correctional officers especially need this stuff. But front desk staff, medical, anyone who interacts with kids. And the leaders need it too so they can understand how to provide a trauma-informed environment support for staff. And we'll talk about that more later. And I think, you know, having training for everyone in the setting also allows for everyone to have a common language um, when they're communicating about it. That's really important. Absolutely. Um, so these are some resources uh, for staff training. So the first one, Think Trauma, uh, is developed by a colleague of mine. She used to be the chief of mental health, I believe, in Ohio's uh, juvenile correctional system. Uh, and it's a really good, you know, uh, introduction to trauma, talks, you know, gives uh, understanding of how trauma affects kids, what triggers them, talks about staff trauma, um, and it provides some basic skills, but that's not enough. That, that's a good start, but then you really need to supplement that with more intensive skills. Now, the one we're going to really plug, it's called Target. Uh, so Target is an evidence-based treatment for PTSD. But the developer of Target, he's created another version of Target that basically you teach the frontline staff in juvenile justice. Uh, so they actually, they did it in Connecticut. They implemented this statewide uh, in juvenile detention, taught it to the frontline staff. And so it's basically, you know, you teach them the core skills of how to, it's really four steps. Knowing a kid's having a false alarm, figuring out what set them off, using a a coping skill to get out of alarm mode and then figuring out what you're going to do next. Now, the cool thing about these skills is it's not just for the kids. Staff use these to manage their own false alarms. Because if a kid is threatening you, that might set off your alarm. And if you're in alarm mode, you might not react in the best way. And so staff actually tell us they find it most helpful in managing their own alarms and helping their coworkers manage their alarms. So, um, the next slide. Uh, actually, let me go back for a second. So, you know, with T4, actually, yeah, I'll say that for a case example in a second. Sorry about that. 
So some challenges and tips related to staff training. So again, it's one of the most important pieces. Don't just pick any old curriculum or PowerPoint presentation you can find because there's literally hundreds on the internet and a lot of them are terrible, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, so if you can, pick something that's been used before, you know, or find a, a Trump expert in your community to help you develop something. Now what Kali was saying earlier, one-time training doesn't work. We've worked with states where they did a half-day training and they're like, now we're trauma-informed. No, you're not. You know, it, one day training never changes anything, you know, because you have to get practice using those skills, get feedback on whether you're doing it right or not. Um, and so we'll tell you a little bit about, to give you an example of what we're doing here in New York City in a second. Uh, but you got to do that. You can't do a one-off training. You might as well not even do it, honestly. Uh, time constraints, as we talked about, um, one of our tips, you know, as a way to help staff practice this, you know, because it's hard to set up new meetings. Most facilities already have more than enough meetings. So build some of this stuff into existing meetings. Um, so for example, one of the agencies we're working with in their case conference meetings, when they talk about clients, they built in the trauma lens. So they talk about the kid's trauma, what triggers them. Uh, and they also talk about how can we use the skills, these T4 skills uh, on site to help this kid do better. Um, Let's see. And so along with that, you have to find a way to monitor, you know, are staff doing it correctly? You know, are they using it the way you want to? Because they're going to need feedback, uh, like with any new skill. And then uh, one more piece of advice is use a train the trainer model. Um, so what we're doing in New York City, and actually let me just segue into that. Uh, so in New York City, you know, first we did Think Trauma for all staff. So everyone was on the same page, had the same knowledge. And they were doing T4 training. And with the train the trainer model, we picked about five or six staff from each agency who are going to be our trainers. We call them the champions. So we gave them a two-day training, and then we met with them twice a month uh, for 12 months to just practice T4. They would talk about situations where their alarm went off or a kid's alarm went off, and we discuss how to use T4. And about midway through that process, that 12 months, they started helping us train their other coworkers. And then we tr we're now training them to be the on-site consultants. You know, so basically the goal is we want these agencies to be able to get rid of us because otherwise they have to keep coming up with funding that they don't have to pay us, and we want them to be able to sustain this on their own. And so using that trainer model is great because if you have staff leave, they can just train the new ones. You don't have to pay for anything. Uh, and again, one last thing I want to highlight that first point. So one of the states we did an organizational assessment for, they did exactly what I said don't do, just a half-day trauma training with no follow-up. We did an organizational assessment where we surveyed all the staff about how trauma-informed the system is. Two-thirds of staff, even though every single one of them had attended this training, two-thirds said they needed more trauma training because the training didn't cover skills. So you must, must, must cover skills. Um, just going back to some of the, the challenges and tips, um, just one last thing, you know, um, it's really important also to re elicit and address any staff concerns about yeah. The training, um, you know, there are definitely staff who may be resistant. They don't necessarily have all the information about what trauma-informed care is. So it's important to really involve them up front so that they understand, you know, what this training is about and give them the opportunity to, to say, you know, why they're concerned and validate those concerns and address them. Mm -hmm. The last thing I'll say about the benefit of a train-the-trainer model is, you know, when we go in and do a training, of course we're going to say trauma-informed care is a good idea, you know, because we're biased. But it is so powerful for staff to hear from a coworker that it's beneficial. So at Rikers Island, we now start every training with one of the correctional officers uh, giving a testimonial about the benefit of learning this stuff. And it is more powerful and gets more staff buy-in than anything Carly or I could ever say because we're outsiders. We don't live their experience. But when they hear it from a correctional officer, they say, okay, I'm going to give this a chance. So that's another major benefit of the train the trainer. 
All right, so the second domain, trauma-informed mental health services. So I know you had a webinar on screening and a webinar on treatment, so we are going to breeze through this stuff. A lot of it we just put in here for your reference. Um, you know, so with trauma-informed mental health services, you want to routinely screen kids uh, for trauma exposure uh, and or symptoms. Um, you want to have evidence-based uh, trauma-informed treatment available. And something else that a lot of people don't talk about is workshops for families. And the reason is a lot of the parents of kids that you work with have their own trauma. And trauma, you know, it influences the family. If you have a traumatized teen and a traumatized parent, both in false alarm mode, that doesn't go well. Um, you know, and kids are going to return to these families from their facilities. So educating families about trauma, even like a single session psycho ed. You know, one of the agencies we worked with, uh, we were doing the target treatment groups for kids, and they said, let's make these groups for parents. So they planned these weekly parent nights, they bought food, they brought parents in, and they taught them the target skills, gave them a little education about trauma, and the parents loved it. And so many parents said, oh, my God, that's me. I have trauma. I have false alarms. So don't forget about the families. I know you have the kids there, but family engagement is so important. So these are some resources, different screening assessment tools, treatments, um, you know, you'll have them in the slides, so we're not going to go over that. Uh, you also have these tips, and there's just a couple we want to highlight that are particularly relevant to like correctional detention settings um, and short-term settings. So, you know, discharge planning is, you know, really important to consider implementing trauma-informed practices. So making sure that when you're referring you you know, to agencies for trauma treatment, making sure those agencies pro actually provide trauma-focused treatment and really assuming that many of them don't. So it's really important to vet those agencies. Um, also, you know, with short-term stays and short-term facilities, a lot of evidence-based treatments, you know, go for about 12 to 24 sessions. So, you know, it may be necessary to adapt those treatments, create sort of shorter versions, and we'll talk a little bit later about how we've done that in one of our agencies. And then, you know, thinking about exposure-based treatment, um, so where you're having, you know, a kid actually be exposed to a traumatic event and, you know, talk about it in narrative form. So we'd really strongly caution against using this in settings that are both, you know, not necessarily safe, um, not necessarily fully trauma-informed yet, um, but also in those shorter-term, for shorter-term stays. So just to add a clarification about that for the non-mental health people, so when you think about trauma treatment, treatments for people with PTSD or trauma symptoms. There's, uh, there, you know, there are trauma treatments where you have to do exposure, which means you talk about the traumatic experience in detail, you write out the details. The idea is doing it over and over in a safe environment makes it less scary. And then there are treatments where you don't do that and it's more focused on here's how you cope in the here and now. Here are skills to deal with your trauma reactions. And so target is an example of the latter. You know, you don't have to go into the memories. And so that's what we're saying in an unsafe, you know, especially in an environment like that where, you know, you don't want a kid to start going through the trauma memories and then they get discharged. Or if they're doing trauma memories and then they go back to a unit that's violent and unsafe, that's a terrible thing. So you can do trauma treatment. It can be skills-based. It can even be short education, you know, um, but really think about what you pick. All right, and so this is just an example of uh, what we're doing with these agencies in New York City. Uh, so screening and assessment, helping them come up with clear criteria of, you know, which kids are going to re be referred for trauma treatment based on their scores on the assessment, uh, and then training staff to do the target treatment groups. So again, you know, there's target, the actual intervention, the therapy that mental health professionals provide, and then there's T4, which is target skills that any kind of staff member can use. All right, so the third domain is youth psychological and physical safety. The next one is going to be staff safety, and safety is the foundation of a trauma-informed organization. Because again, trauma involves a loss of safety. And when people who've been through trauma feel unsafe, they have those false alarms. If you have kids and staff who are in false alarm mode all the time, you cannot be a trauma-informed agency. 
So most trauma experts in the world would agree that helping people feel safe is the foundation of recovery from trauma, okay? So, and again, it's not just physical safety, you know, but that's really important in correctional facilities. We know, you know, there's physical violence, sexual violence. Um, and so we want to do everything we can, you know, to reduce that. But also psychological safety, because again, kids have false alarms, you know, uh, they don't have to be in actual danger. It can just be something that reminds them of their trauma. So uh, when people talk about, you know, so all this sounds great, but how do you create a physically, psychologically safe environment for kids and for their families, you know, when they visit? So one uh, big emphasis in facilities is trying to restrict the use of harsh or coercive practices like punitive isolation or physical restraint. You know, the worst false alarm I've ever seen as a psychologist was a teenage girl who'd been severely sexually abused and I was in an inpatient unit and she was being physically restrained and she was re experiencing she was going through her rape again. She was yelling, they're raping me, help, help. It was the most awful thing I saw and it was terrible for staff and all the kids. Um, you know, and same isolation. If you're a kid who is, you know, left unattended for hours or locked in the closet by your parents, that can make you, you know, have these false alarms where you really feel like you're in danger. So trying to, you know, basically a big goal is, you know, we want to use more positive behavior management systems. We want to, you know, keep kids accountable, but not just by punishing them, but by making them work to use their skills, to manage their reactions, to do better next time, and to make amends when they mess up. But we want to avoid power struggles. We want to avoid threats. Now, they're understandable. Because if, you know, if it seems like things are getting out of control and you're the only staff member, you want to regain control as quick as possible. And so people will get loud or get aggressive because they think that's how to shut it down. But that may just trigger a traumatized kid and make them react even more. So we, we want to avoid that. We really want to, you know, not use threats and coercion. Um, and so along with that respectful, collaborative, uh, you know, youth staff relationships. Another big piece of this is youth and family, what we call voice and choice. You know, so again, if you're being traumatized, it involves a loss of control. You know, you don't have any say in what's happening to you. So there's two big ways that you can give youth and families voice. The first is really privileging their preferences when you're planning their services or planning their discharge. You know, that can be, you know, for discharge planning, what community they want to go to for treatment, or, you know, if they want individual versus family therapy, or what they think, you know, they need besides treatment, like school help. Um, and I've done focus groups with kids in the system, and i got to tell you, they're experts on what they need. Uh, and then the other piece is getting youth and family feedback on your agency. You know, customer satisfaction, basically, which may sound weird, but these are the people you serve. And they often are the most knowledgeable, besides frontline staff, about what needs to change. Um, and when we've done projects, uh, for example, in Florida, we went in and did focus groups and interviews uh, with kids and their parents to get their feedback on what needed to change. And we got a lot of great insight. Um, another one is clear and consistent rules uh, and grievance process. Uh, I won't go into that. The mental health folks can explain it to you, but basically consistency is really important to people who've been through trauma because chaos, the unexpected, uh, can be a trigger. Uh, so along with that, having a predictable schedule. And then the last piece uh, is having like a therapeutic welcoming environment. Now, I know that may sound weird for corrections, you know, but it's not just about having soft furniture or nice rugs or anything. Actually, let me show you an example. So these are some pictures of uh, Nashville, Tennessee's Juvenile Detention Center. It's one of the nicest juvenile detention centers I've ever seen. I got a tour of the detention center by the judge, and the kids locked up there were waving and smiling at the judge. I've never seen such happy kids in detention in my life. Um, they still wanted to get out there. Don't worry. But this is an example. This place was secure. You know, they still had all the same services in place. But, but instead of, you know, Every sign on the wall being, don't do this, you'll get in trouble for that, you can't do this, this is restricted. The messages are positive, you know, uh, and that makes a difference. 
in the upper left corner, that's a little like outdoor serenity area. It's like a coping area. There's a garden out there that the kids tend to, but it's also a place they can go. If they go into false alarm mode, they need to calm down, they can go there and chill out. So uh, just wanted to give you a quick uh, you know, idea of what, you know, some changes you can make to the physical environment to make it more welcoming. And then here are some resources uh, with other ideas on youth safety. So real quick tips, uh, do a walkthrough assessment of your agency procedures policies from a youth's perspective to see what might be triggering, what might be traumatizing. You know, so we actually stole this from uh, other people, uh, but it's a wonderful idea. You know, so going through the admissions process, you know, going through uh, from the unit to the classroom or to the therapy room, you know, going through as a parent coming in to do a visit and think about if I was a trauma survivor, would any of these things set me off? Um, and then figure out what you need to modify. Uh, trauma-informed safety plans. So you may have safety plans, but trauma-informed safety plans are different. It can be like a one-pager, and it's basically like these are the the triggers, the things that set off my false alarm. These are the warning signs. Like basically this is how I behave when I'm starting to go in alarm mode so that staff know, okay, this kid's having a, a reaction. And then the kid's preferences for how the staff can help them cope. So in one state I worked with uh, in their juvenile correctional facility, they posted every single kid's safety plan on the door to their room with their permission. So that way, you know, because staff can't memorize 80, you know, safety plans, but if a kid's going off on the unit, they can look at the door real quick, say, okay, this is what helps them calm down. Um, so that's a really quick free thing that you can do. Uh, again, develop processes for collecting feedback from youth and family satisfaction surveys, community meetings, forums, having them on advisory boards, uh, and again, trying to eliminate or at least really restrict the use of harsh practices. So this is some of what uh, we've been doing in New York City. Um, you know, so uh, going through, trying to figure out what uh, practices are triggering. Um, then, you know, helping staff figure out how do we apply the target T4 skills to these kinds of situations. So two situations that are happen a lot in juvenile justice that are really common and triggers for kids with trauma. Number one, giving bad news. So that parent who's unreliable and is supposed to visit, and then the last minute they cancel, or the kid thought they're getting discharged, but you know they're being held longer, or the case got continued, that can set them off. Another thing that really sets off kids with trauma is limit setting and criticism. Now you have to set limits, and you have to tell kids they're doing bad sometimes. You know that, you know we're not saying don't do that. But you have to be conscious that that might set kids off and think about how you do it. Um, and so that's, you know, when we practice the skills with the staff, these are the kinds of situations we rehearse. We role play them. And we'll, Carly and I will sit there and be pain in the butt teenagers, you know, and we'll make them use T4 to deal with us. So that's why we, you know, keep talking about the need for ongoing consultation practice. And then, uh, you know, as far as questionnaires, you know, you can create one. Um, There's some surveys out there which we've listed. We'd be happy to give you more info. All right, so now staff safety uh, and trauma prevention. So Chris mentioned, you know, that safety is like the cornerstone of trauma-informed care and it's, you know, can't emphasize enough how important it is to address staff safety and prevention of secondary trauma. Um, you know, you can implement extensive services for addressing trauma for kids and train staff to, you know, address trauma for kids. Um, but if the staff don't feel safe in their environment and they don't feel supported, none of those things are going to be effective or sustainable. So some of the things that we've really seen that are important for staff safety, you know, overall communication, making sure staff feel supported and giving them a voice. So making sure that there are safe working conditions, so both you know, physically safe and also psychologically safe. So making sure that they feel supported when something happens, you know, a workplace trauma or something happens to one of their clients. Um, making sure that they have adequate training so they know, you know that, like we mentioned those skills earlier about you know, de-escalating situations and working with kids who have a history of um, trauma or traumatic stress. And then also you know, implementing staff forums and letting staff, you know, just like we mentioned for kids, making sure staff feel like they 
have a sense of control and ownership over the jobs that they're doing um, and that they can provide feedback and know that that feedback will be considered and validated and taken into consideration to make changes. Um, avoiding scapegoating and blaming during client related crises. We've heard this so many times at the agencies that we work with. You know, something will happen where um, a client will, will die and the, you know, probation officer, correction officer, you know, the, the first thing that's asked of them is, you know, is your file in order? What did you do or didn't do in the situation? Um, and no one really asking that staff member, are you okay? Um, so it's really important to make sure, you know, to be supporting staff in those situations. And this, you know, this is particularly true when your staff are assaulted or they see one of their coworkers assaulted or even they hear about coworkers being assaulted. Um, you know, because again, one officer told us, you know, if they come visit you in the hospital after you've been injured on the job, it's only to sign like, you know, an incident report or a waiver that you're not going to sue but never to check in on how you're doing. And you can't just ask once. And the thing is a lot of supervisors, particularly if you're like a correctional officer, you know, who's supervising, you probably never got trained on how to help support your staff emotionally once they've been victimized. So that's a new experience for them. So, you know, we're not criticizing leaders. We're saying they need support around how to address this too. And then related to that, you know, communication both between staff and leadership, but also between coworkers and staff members. And then addressing staff traumatic stress. We're actually going to talk a little bit more about that now. So, you know, correction staff in particular, you know, including mental health staff, you know, are working directly with trauma survivors. They're hearing the details of, of trauma stories from the kids that they work with um, and also coworkers. There's a threat of, you know, actual violence, threat of violence in many correctional facilities. And all of this can lead, you know, to negative impacts. So, you know, secondary traumatic stress, when we talk about that, you know, we mean um, when somebody has experienced that, you know, hearing details, actually being confronted directly with trauma, they can develop post-traumatic stress symptoms. So things like being hypervigilant, um, you know, not being able to concentrate, and that can really affect job performance, calling out sick a lot, burnout, wanting to leave the profession. There are so many ways that secondary traumatic stress can affect um, people in, you know, corrections, and it's so important to address. Yeah, and, you know, it's not just about the, the health of an individual staff member because, you know, I want you to think of false alarms almost like a virus that can spread. You know, so something we've heard from staff in really violent prisons is, you know, there's all this violence, they don't feel supported by leadership. So some staff, you know, when their false alarms go off, they go into fight mode. They react really aggressively to the kids to try to maintain order. Then there's other staff who go into flight mode. They're so worried about getting in trouble for hurting someone or, you know, escalating the situation, getting assaulted, that they don't do anything. And that puts people in danger. And then coworkers get ticked at each other because, oh, you're not doing your job or you always, you know, get too aggressive and cause more problems and they stop functioning like a team. And then people stop trusting each other. In corrections, you got to have a team. You got to have each other's back. That is such a dangerous, emotionally taxing and physically taxing job. And if you have a bunch of people in trauma mode, remember when you're in false alarm mode, all you care about is your safety. You don't care about the greater good. Your alarm is selfish. Great when you're in danger, but if you're not in danger and you constantly have people in your facility walking around just thinking about themselves, you are going to have a terrible work environment and you're not going to keep your staff. And it's all going to influence the kids. So again, it's really not just, okay, I may have one staff who's traumatized. Their trauma spreads and it makes them more likely to traumatize the kids. So, you know, ways to prevent staff traumatic stress. There are many. So, you know, having those regular opportunities for staff to be able to come together without leadership, with leadership, um, and be able to voice concerns and talk about the, the work. Making sure, you know, if there is supervision in place um, in the setting, making sure that, you know, supervisors are addressing, you know, job stressors for their supervisees. Debriefing protocols. I just want to say, you know, a couple words about this. So, it's, you know, what we mean by this is, you know, having something in place, having a protocol in place so that when something happens um, in the workplace, everybody knows what to expect and staff know that they're going to be supported and how. 
Um, so when she says something, she means like a crisis. So for example, like a serious fight involving kids or a staff was injured or you witness the kid, you know, kill themselves or try to kill themselves. And so, you know, basically having a procedure in place of this is how we're going to respond and make sure everyone's okay afterwards. And there are a couple of reasons that's important. You know, one of them is so that people know what to expect. Um, but also when you're in the middle of a crisis, that's not the time to necessarily be deciding about how to handle it. It's really good to do that ahead of time before people are in alarm mode. Um, you know, there's some sort of controversy in the literature about how to do this. Um, but overall, it's really important to avoid focusing too much on emotional reactions that staff are having and really focusing more emphasis on problem solving and coping skills and also referring to resources if that's needed. Like your employee assistance or, you know, it's really reminding staff, like, we're here for you, there's support for you, and, you know, there's also places you can seek help, but you don't want to turn it into like a therapy group. Right. So yeah, so employee assistance program is another way, you know, I think in some settings that sometimes there's a stigma around staff members even accessing something like EAP. So in that sort of setting, you know, making sure to do your best to minimize that stigma and make it so that people can actually access those services without actually having negative consequences. So correctional officers have told us there's no way I'd ever tell my boss that I'm stressed because they'll take my badge or, you know, I won't get promotions or everyone will think I'm crazy or weak. So that's a real problem. Um, and that may be something, if that's kind of the culture, you know, it, where people are scared to seek help, you may need to really work on that. It's not just enough to have an EAP if people are scared to use it. So, you know, again, other, other strategies, making sure there's that open communication, making sure there are places where, you know, people from different disciplines can come together in team meetings, wellness activities, even, you know, off-site wellness activities. We've had some agencies do things like picnics outside of work, and that's been really helpful. Uh, making sure to just celebrate staff success. Um, we had one agency, we, we had, they had a, um, a luncheon where staff actually elected other staff members for awards and, you know, celebrated their successes and that went really well. And another example, you know, and this staff wellness stuff can be cheap because I know, again, people probably thinking, okay, how much does all this cost? And the reason we emphasize this is, you know, the work is hard and we find staff, they're e ably easily able to remember all their failures at work, but it's hard for them to remember all the good work they've done. So one agency created a compliment box where you can just anonymously write down, hey, I saw my coworker doing this awesome thing. And then at their weekly team meetings, they dump them out, they read the slips, and then other people pile on compliments. So oh, yeah, Joe's really good at that. It's free, it takes five minutes, and it gets people in a good mood on a Monday morning. And then finally, you know, providing mentoring to new professionals. And I think related to that, you know, oh, there's another one. Um, related to that, when new, new people are coming on the job, making sure that all of this is incorporated into orientation so that they know that all these, um, all these you know, activities and supports exist. Yeah, so at one of the prisons we're working with, uh, they want to put all this T4 trauma training into the training academy for new officers. So they want them to get all this training before they ever step foot. Uh, and the old system was kind of, you learned on the job, you know, you didn't get much training, you figured it out, you know, sink or swim. And then supporting continuing education, so just making sure that staff have an opportunity to get the trainings that, that they want, you know, identifying the things that are important to them. So real quick, it shouldn't just be the agency leader who's picking out the new training topics. Ask staff what they actually want to learn, what they need to learn. Yeah. Uh, and so here are some different resources uh, for staff safety. And then just, you know, some challenges and tips related to this. So again, you know, just don't neglect this piece. This is really, really important. Yeah. Um, so give you a couple of, uh, of examples of things that uh, folks have done. Um, so one is uh, in one state, uh, they, you know, they had no money for wellness activities, but they're able to find a yoga instructor who actually had been through the system and was able, you know, willing to volunteer, you know, uh, like a couple times a month to do, uh, you know, mindfulness yoga classes for staff. Um, let's see. Uh, again, you know, 
it doesn't have to be something that you invest a lot of money in. There's a lot of, you know, and engage your staff, you know, have them think about things they've done at different agencies uh, that have been beneficial. Uh, the second point I really want to emphasize, um, so, you know, for us mental health people, we're used to talking about our feelings, you know, that's what we do. But if you go in and start telling correctional officers or, you know, probation officers or attorneys or whoever that they need to start talking about work stress and feelings, they may get it and say, yes, we need to, but they probably haven't been trained on how to do that. You know, one of the agencies, they started doing this, uh, talking about staff stress in their weekly team meetings. And after the first time they tried it, they came back and they're like, well, I did, but it was frustrating. There was just so many feelings and they just kept wanting to talk about them. And we were like, yeah, that's the point, because you've never asked them. They're dying to let this stuff out. And, but the supervisors really had no idea what to do with it. So for the mental health folks, you may need to help some of your colleagues in leadership figure out, okay, this is, this is how you address this stuff in supervision. You know, it's not therapy, but it's just giving staff a space to vent, talk about stuff, and come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. And so along with that, like I was just saying, you know, I – I'm no longer shocked, but I've gotten the most intense reactions when I start talking about secondary trauma. I'll never forget this probation officer who'd been working for 40 years, like broke down in tears and was practically yelling at me like, I've been traumatized for 40 years and now you want to talk to me about this stuff? So there, you got to be prepared that there may be a lot of pent up, strong negative emotions, but you got to get it out there. You got to find a way to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, there's a lot of different ways you can address this stuff, but ask your staff what they prefer. Some staff don't want to talk to their supervisors, but they'll talk to their coworkers. So you could create a peer support group. Some people don't want to talk to anyone in the agency. They want to go see an outside therapist. There's lots of different ways. Ask your staff what they need. All right, and so real quick, this is what we're doing uh, in New York City. So as part of our organizational assessment, our baseline assessment of how trauma-informed staff were, we administered a questionnaire to see, you know, how much trauma symptoms all the staff have. And in some agencies, 50% had PTSD symptoms. And we also asked staff if they felt like their supervisors were aware of secondary trauma, if they were responsive to it, and if they felt like their agency was doing enough. So that helped us really figure out, okay, Where's the agency at? What do we need to put into place? And then these are some of the specific things we just talked about that we're doing at these agencies. Okay, this last one we're going to go through real quickly, cross-systems collaboration. The main idea is that kids in the justice system with trauma are often involved in multiple systems that are trying to help them, like the child welfare system, the mental health system, substance use, special education. And it's best if everyone's kind of on the same page and coordinating care. You know, if you have a trauma-informed detention center, but then you send a kid home to a non-trauma-informed school or a therapist that's not trauma-informed, that's not so good. Um, now, what's most relevant, I think, for facilities is collaboration around discharge planning. So many facilities drop the ball at discharge planning. They give kids a phone number or a list of places, but we really recommend vetting and coming up with a list of trusted providers particularly ones that you know provide good trauma-informed care, and develop relationships with them. So one thing we've heard is, you know, find a point person in that agency, someone that you know, okay, that's who I go to with any kind of questions. Develop relationships. Go visit these places to see if you'd want to send your kids there, because I guarantee you, if you can improve your discharge planning, you're going to reduce some of the repeat offenders, the kids who are coming right back to your facility. Now there's you know legal restrictions on information sharing all this other kind of stuff, um, but there's resources out there that can help walk you through that. Um, it's not just across systems, but across departments. So we also hear in a lot of facilities that there's poor communication and collaboration between mental health and you know security staff. So have multidisciplinary case meetings you know, where you come together and talk about how you're going to deal with the kid's behavior on the unit in a trauma-informed way and let everyone have input. It shouldn't be the mental health staff telling security staff, this is what we're going to do. They need to be partners. And I guarantee you, if you train them well and make them real partners, they will astound you with what they can do. 
and there are some resources including on, on like setting up information sharing toolkits and things like that. All right. Uh, so real quick, because we know a lot of you work in facilities with shorter lengths of stay, we're going to talk about uh, really quickly what you can do. Yeah. So um, really, you know, if if you have trauma-informed care in place throughout the setting, then all youth can really benefit from that, and all staff as well, regardless of, you know, how long the length of stays are. Um, so you really want, you know, as we've said throughout this presentation, you really want those principles to be integrated from entry to exit. So, in, you know, including training for all different um, types of staff members. So just quickly, you know, in terms of services, so you, you know, definitely can be doing screening early on. Um, as we mentioned, you know, longer term treatments may be more difficult, but there are, you know, definitely ways to adapt treatments um, so that, you know, you can make them a little bit shorter so that they focus more on you know, psychoeducation about trauma, about its impact, so you can really normalize that for kids, but also um, allowing them to have coping skills. And those things can really be done in shorter term treatments. And so in one agency, it's a short term diversion program. Uh, we created a three session version of Target because they asked us to. Um, yeah, so it's important just, you know, to have, make everyone on the same, you know, have the same common language. Um, so just, you know, very quickly, some examples of ways that we've um, been able to adapt to the shorter term stays. So in one community agency, as Chris mentioned, you know, we took a 10 session target um, group treatment and we made it into three sessions. Um, so it's really, you know, focusing on, you know, goals, um, identifying triggers, staff well-being, again, you know, definitely don't want to neglect that. And then looking at the physical space and ways that the agency can put up posters and make the space a little bit more inviting um, for youth and for staff. And then we've been providing consultation and training. Um, and then we're going to be um, working on uh, a, a project soon, hopefully, um, in, a, in secure and non-secure detention settings. And so all of those things will also be implemented, but there's also, um, uh, we're also going to be implementing what's called a trauma passport so that youth can go, you know, uh, through all of the different continuums of the system. So as we mentioned, you know, that cross-system collaboration, um, so there can be continu uh, you know, continuity in care. So when youth are going maybe from a secure detention setting to a non-secure detention setting and then discharge, everyone along the way already has the information about that youth um, that's applicable to trauma and other needs. Yeah, which also saves the kid from having to go through a trauma assessment every time they go to a new program, because that can be traumatized. Absolutely. Um, and again, just ensures people are on the same page. So just a couple more slides, we'll jump to the questions. So we wove a lot of these tips in, but, you know, start with an assessment of where you're at. Um, so we actually have an organizational assessment survey that we've created. You give it to all your staff. You know, it asks about trauma-informed care stuff, what you have in place. And then we score it and create recommendations. Um, we're validating the measure right now. It is free. If you want it, we will send it to you. You don't have to pay us to use it. You can change it, do whatever you want with it. We're also happy to provide consultation on how to use it. Um, but also, you know, like, you know, get information from youth and families as part of that assessment. So basically, you want to you have a starting point. Know where you're at. Know where we need to go. Uh, and having a kickoff meeting, you know, you want all staff to know about this project, to be excited about it, and to know that they're going to have an opportunity to be involved. And so, you know, the lead, it, there's so many pieces to this that no one person can plan it all. So create a committee. Involve staff from every discipline. Involve frontline staff, supervisors, leadership. Maybe even have subcommittees. Like at one place, there's a an agency culture, you know, a uh, staff wellness committee, uh, you know, youth satisfaction committee, you know, so you're basically splitting up the work, but you're also getting staff more invested by giving them ownership over the project. Um, make sure you have funding for this. There are grants out there. We're happy to, you know, direct people towards grants. Uh, and you got to build in that ongoing supervision. Staff really need opportunity to keep practicing. Uh, last two things, CQI. So you, you have to find a way to measure, is this working? Is it improving outcomes? Is it worth all the effort? A lot of juvenile justice systems are not set up to do that. So partner with local academics, researchers, who can help you set that up. There are lots of people out there, and I know most of the trauma-informed researchers, I can direct you to them, who would love to work with you on a grant, you know. And so if you partner with the, an expert like that, you can get training that you otherwise might not be able to afford because the grant pays for it. 
All right, so last thing, small group exercise. This is something uh, I do in in-person trainings, but it's a way to start, you know, and it's in the handouts uh, that I'll be sending. But it lists the different elements of a trauma-informed agency, and you can take a look at what are we doing already that's trauma-informed, what's not trauma-informed, um, and start to come up with ideas about what to change. So in conclusion, uh, you know, we think that trauma-informed care holds great promise uh, for improving outcomes for youth, their families, juvenile justice professionals. We forgot to mention earlier the research on this. Um, we're actually writing another review paper. We've looked at all the research studies on trauma-informed care and juvenile justice. There's about four studies in uh, juvenile justice facilities, um, and all of them have found reductions in violence, reductions in seclusion, reductions in restraint. Uh, two of them found increases in uh, staff satisfaction, sense of safety, youth reported feeling more safe, uh, and when they implemented it statewide in Connecticut's detention centers, youth recidivism in the state went down. So um, let's see, in terms of other conclusions, you know, again, clearly this takes time. It is a process. Uh, it's not going to be a one-off training, you know, so what I say is go big or go home. You know, really go for it. Um, don't just try to do it quick or half-baked or there's no point. But remember that a lot of these things can be implemented at little or no cost. You know, so if you're going to prioritize what to spend on, spend money on staff training. That's what to spend your money on. A lot of this other stuff you can do for free. So that uh, concludes our talk. We appreciate everyone. Uh, we have our contact info here. If you have any questions down the road, want to be connected to other, you know, experts or resources. And now I think we'll open it up to questions. And a reminder, uh, so Ned just types up, we'll be emailing, they'll be emailing the links to the slides, handouts, and video recording in the next 48 hours. Great. Thank you so much, Chris and Carly. Uh, really, really a comprehensive um, look into how agencies can become really trauma-informed care agencies. And we have been getting questions along the way, so I'm going to start with the first one that came in from Lisa. Uh, she wants to know if anyone's developed an employee evaluation for caseworkers that incorporate the key aspects for staff work um, related to trauma-informed care, because you mentioned it is important to have, um, uh, to have this. Uh, are you familiar, Chris, with any, or Carly, with any employee evaluation that have been already developed? Uh, well, if you mean like in terms of like doing performance evaluations, which you'd normally do for employees and building in like, you know, whether they, you know, have learned the trauma-informed care stuff as part of that, if that's what they're that's, asking. That's what it sounds like. Okay. Uh, that I'm not aware of, but I think that's a great idea, and it's something people recommend is, you know, working this stuff into your hiring and, you know, staff evaluation. Um, that's a great question. I'll, uh, I can ask colleagues in the National Child Trauma Express Network and see if they know of anything. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and if any of our participants in their agencies are aware, if they're aware of, of an evaluation that incorporates the principles of trauma-informed care and whether or not staff are truly impl um, implementing them, uh, let us know. Um, just do, a, uh, do an email to info at cjca.net, and then we can uh, get it to uh, those who are participating. Okay. One thing I'll add is that, you know, as part of our study, we're trying to develop a way for supervisors to be able to assess whether staff have learned T4. Um, so we're in the process of developing that, but it's not, you know, it won't be finalized uh, till next year. Okay, and then the next question, um, is there an agency level type of assessment to help agencies see their strengths and weaknesses? And again, I, I presume it's related to trauma-informed care, um, but uh, a, a way of an agency head stepping back and using a an assessment um, protocol to help them see their strengths and weaknesses. Yes, absolutely. So there's there's assessments uh, where you can see how trauma informed your agency is, and then there's also assessments um, of readiness for change, which means 
Like, do you have enough resources, the right kind of staff? Do you have a good work environment? So that's just like, are you ready to implement new changes in general? Um, now, as far as the, uh, the organizational assessments of trauma-informed care, the ones that are published and out there so far are not specific to juvenile justice. Um, I can actually add some of that to the handouts. The one we're creating, I'm sorry for the shameless self-promotion, is actually the first uh, organizational assessment of trauma-informed care specifically for juvenile justice. Uh, we piloted it in four states, and right now we're writing up a paper about you know, its reliability and validity. Um, and that was the measure I mentioned I would be happy to give uh, you can have it for free. Um, you know, we're not trying to make any money off of it, so you can use it. You can add questions. Uh, we can give, you know, some free advice on how to administer it, score it, or, you know, and we've also been hired as consultants to actually analyze the data and write up a report with recommendations. Um, so, so, yes, absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, this is one from Lois, and I think it's uh, responsive to your slide on cross-agency collaboration when you talked about a youth leaving a trauma-informed facility and then moving to something that's not trauma-informed. So she said, how can we transfer these strategies to an alternative school setting? So let's see, say a kid is leaving uh, the correctional system and going to an alternative school. Um, are there ways to transfer these strategies or is it basically educating the school that they need to have a trauma-informed care program? That is an excellent question, and really that's the million-dollar question. Because um, I have colleagues who focus on trauma-informed schools, trauma-informed child welfare, because all of these systems touch our kids. Um, so there's a couple things. I mean, you know, if you think big, you know, it, you really want to start educating everyone else. Um, you know, so you could like try to convene a community trauma training where you bring in some expert and you invite people from all the different agencies and service systems just to start getting people on the same page. Um, in South Carolina, I have a colleague, Ben Saunders, one of the things they've done, they've done these kind of cross trainings where they bring together different systems agencies and they actually train the others, okay, this is my role, these are my challenges, limitations. Because a lot of times, you know, different systems, providers don't like each other, they think the other system's a problem. So those trainings built familiarity, helped them understand more of the other roles, um, and then it got them more willing to say, okay, now I'm open to this trauma-informed care stuff that you're selling. You know, so a lot of it is getting people from different systems in the same room, developing those relationships and spreading the knowledge. Um, so think about who in your, in your community is like an opinion leader that could help lead that. You know, is there a judge? Is there, a, you know, a state or county mental health system administrator, a policymaker, or someone? Um, but that's a lot of it. But on an individual basis, you know, I've gone in with some of the kids that I work with who have trauma. I go to the school and I talk to the teachers about T4. And this is the kids' signs they're having, you know. So you can, like, provide consultation to, like, individual, you know, like the an individual teacher or one particular school. So it can be done on a small basis or on a big basis. Thank you, Chris. Um, here's a question. It sounds as if workers need to be aware of all individuals' triggers and have a plan for responding. And the um, person who submitted is saying, well, is that practical? What about, and then what about consistency from one youth to another youth, which I'm trying to interpret, but I think he or she means, well, do they have different triggers and uh, is there a common denominator? But um, sure. Yeah, great or, question. So, you know, in terms of the triggers, you're absolutely right. It's not feasible for a staff member to remember all the triggers for 80 different kids. Um, but for the safety plans, you know, knowing like what, helps a particular kid cope. Again, that's why you need to post them somewhere that it's easy to see. But there are certain triggers that you can plan for. So let me give you a quick example. Uh, there's a kid in one facility who got in a fight during lunch every day. And what they figured out was he got triggered when people walked behind him. So they had the simple solution. They made him sit with his back against the wall during the cafeteria. Fight's over. You know, another kid would assault staff whenever woken up in the morning 
because it reminded them of being, you know, stirred from bed for sexual abuse in the middle of the night. So they figured that out with the kid and they just came up with a new system. This is how we're going to wake you up in the morning. Now, the last thing I'll say is with the T4 skills, a lot of times there's no opportunity to figure out what the kid's trigger was. And it's not even important sometimes. You know, once a kid's already triggered in false alarm mode, the most important thing is getting them out of alarm mode and not making it worse. So, you know, like in terms of every staff knowing all kids' triggers, no. But if there are a couple kids who are really problematic, really reactive, really violent, then I think it's useful for all staff to know that kid's trigger. Um, and in terms of consistency, there's a lot of overlap among triggers, but it's so dependent on the person and their trauma. And, you know, so there are some that are common, um, but it's really, you know, kid by kid basis. A great question. Hey, thank you. Um, and this question is from Elena, uh, Chris, or Carly. Similar to having workshops or information to the families of youth, could it also be helpful to have outreach to families of corrections professionals about trauma, et cetera? Do you know of any examples of this? That, that sounds like a great question because people bring their problem, their trauma home sometimes from the, from the agencies. That is a fantastic idea, and I'd love to write a grant with whoever asked that question to look at that. Um, <laughs> that is actually, you know, something I'll say is uh, with preventing and dealing with staff trauma, we're way behind, way behind. you know, and I about to go annoy. out the best way to do it. And I'm not aware right offhand. I think there's been some work with uh, the spouses of law enforcement, um, but I'll have to look uh you know, I can look into uh, other resources and, uh, you know, see what I can send. But that would be an outstanding program to develop. You would be an innovator in the country if you did that. Yeah, that's an Chris, let's work together. This is Jennifer. Jennifer? I just said I want to work on that with Chris. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> You're, another project. You're, you're volunteers. Um, so here's a question of uh, how often should trauma assessments be completed? I understand there's trauma involved with each, but trauma may continue to be happening and the score continue to change. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think in terms of repeated assessment, what's most important is the symptoms. You know, how is it affecting them? Um, but I think, you know, when you're reassessing the symptoms, you can also ask, you know, has any new trauma occurred? Um, and I think that's particularly important in facilities where there's a good chance, you know, that it's occurred. But you don't need to go through a comprehensive assessment of every kind of trauma they've ever had every time. You know, if you already know their abuse as a kid, don't ask about it again. Just anything new that's happened that, you know, has been traumatic or difficult. You can also use shorter screeners instead of going into a full assessment, a shorter screening tool. Well, I'll say Patricia Carrick has written a lot about this, uh, has some fact sheets out there that are included in the resources. Um, so I definitely recommend reading some of her stuff as well. We have time for two more questions. One is a very quick answer. Um, what is meant by T4? I think that had to do with the target curriculum, but uh, you know better than me. Yeah, so Target uh, is, is a therapy, a mental health treatment for people with PTSD, and then T4 is Target 1, 2, 3, 4. So T4 is basically like you take the, the key skills from Target and you teach them to frontline juvenile justice staff. So mental health therapists deliver the Target treatment groups, and then all the other staff learn T4, which is they can use, you know, in the milieu, on the hallway, you know, interacting with kids. Great, and here's the final question. So what is essential in terms of implementation of this sort of training, namely on uh, trauma-informed care? I know you say one time is not enough, but how do you gauge that the training is successful and how many trainings does it take for success on average, based on your experience, I, I presume the person means? Yeah, and so as a field, we are trying to figure out exactly how much ongoing consultation people need. Like nobody in the field knows this. There are a lot of people researching it. And that's not just for trauma-informed care. That's teaching staff any new practice. But the research is clear that a single training doesn't work. Um, it's not clear 
factor of like how much you need. You know, uh, again, we're doing one year, twice a month. Um, but I think the key thing is they get a chance to practice it. And, you know, you, you got to pick somewhere as a starting point, you know. So we also check in regularly with staff to ask, you know, how do you feel you're coming along? Do you feel like you're getting it? And then we also periodically assess their fidelity, uh, which is, are they doing it skillfully? Um, so basically, there is no clear answer. We don't know how long, it, but again, I don't want you to think of, okay, if they have a year of consultation, they never have to talk about it again, because it won't work. You still have to find ways that they get to keep talking about it in staff meetings, have, you know, with their supervisors. So, you know, I would say like a year is probably good for, you know, a starting point for the ongoing consultation. But during that year, you need to be building it into other team meetings and supervision. And really like not forgetting about the new staff who are starting in the meantime that need, you know, the initial trainings and refresher trainings for staff who haven't had the trainings in a while. One thing we didn't get into, I want to say real quick, is you have to tailor that training to the role of the staff. So what a front desk staff needs to know is different from medical, is different from security, is different from leadership. It can't be one size fits all. And so even the examples you use, like we did a training just for front desk staff because they deal with particular issues. issues. And then we did different training for case managers, a different one for supervisors, leaders. You don't have to have whole new trainings, but just think about tweaking it for different groups. Well, we're at the 3.30 mark, and so uh, on behalf of uh, CJCA, especially the Mental Health Work Group, Chris and Carly, we really thank you for your really, really enlightening presentation this afternoon. As you can see, you inspired some really good questions, and I know there'll probably be um, a fair amount of follow-up. And just to tell everyone, again, we said we're going to send you a copy of today's PowerPoint uh, with a copy of the video recording. And if, if you missed any of the three previous webinars, which were all first-rate webinars uh, on TIC. You can view them on the CJCA YouTube page. And I just want to tell everyone, I have the privilege of being with Chris, not this Friday, but next Friday. We'll be doing, he'll be doing the training in Indiana uh, at the Division, uh, Division of Youth Services for about uh, 75 to 100 of their staff. It's a training he did a year ago, and Chris Plessinger asked if he would do another training for staff who weren't able to have that. And so in person, he's, he's even better than on a, uh, on a webinar. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with Chris again. So again, Chris and Carly, thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who participated this afternoon. I hope you uh, got, got a lot out of this. And again, we'll be, getting, uh, we'll be following up with you. Thanks a lot and have a good rest of the afternoon and evening. Thanks, thank you.